You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. If you like this podcast, can we recommend another one? It's called Big Picture Science. You can hear it wherever you get your podcasts, and its name tells part of the story. The big picture questions and the most interesting research in science. Seth and I are the hosts. Seth is a scientist. I am Molly, and I'm a science journalist. And we talk to people smarter than us, and we have fun along the way. The show is called Big Picture Science, and as Seth said, you can hear it wherever you get your podcasts. In 1850, the ship, the Oregon, sailed from San Francisco with an odd combination of cargo, a state constitution for a proposed new state out of the recently won Mexican California, and $3 million worth of gold. The two items of cargo were related, and as the ship with its load of carpet-bagging politicians from north and south, whose time in the new area of California could have been expressed in months rather than years, as they made the arduous voyage through the jungles of Panama, towards the nation's capital. Congress was debating what to do with land so recently conquered. That debate and its resolution probably speaks more to the concept of an American statehood than anything else. Statehood. We hear the word all the time, statehood. But what is it? What is it that makes an American state a state? An incredible moment of serendipity occurred when, on Swiss immigrant John Sutter's property near Sacramento, gold was discovered. Thousands of so-called 49ers came to what had just become American property after the treaty that ended the Mexican War. Nine out of ten of these 49ers were male. Some were deserting sailors from U.S. Navy ships. Some were passengers from the 60 ships that would quickly bring people from Boston, Philadelphia, and New York, sailing around the Cape of Horn, or dropping them off on the Isthmus of Panama for a potentially malarial voyage to the land of fortune, as advertised in city newspapers. Still others came from Western Outpost, Mormons from Utah, travelers from Iowa or Missouri. And still others came from Chile, Malaysia, or Southern China. For 1849, this was quite a mix of people. In the space of one year, the sparsely populated Mexican Outpost grew to a population of 100,000, with thriving cities of Sacramento near Sutter's Farm. And the sea base for gold seekers, San Francisco. Never before had anything on the western frontier sprung up so fast, and it was a mixed blessing for the United States at the time. Lacking a reasonable route, no railroad ran to California at this time, and overland routes were difficult, injuries were probable for travelers. California would be tough for the U.S. to manage, not to mention the divisions in the U.S. Adding a new state would lead to questions as to whether this new state would be free or slave. For incoming President Zachary Taylor, California should be left alone. He would be fine with having it settled by Americans and having it be a separate independent nation as long as it was friendly to the United States. Once gold was discovered, that option was not possible. California had to be owned. Statehood was a central question of the nation's founders. It was not to be elusive. Desire to grow the nation is part of what led to conflict with Britain. So, when independence was won, few wanted to remain just 13 states. Thomas Jefferson, when asked by Congress about what the best definition of a state would be, said that it would be a landmass two degrees high and four degrees long. If one applied his definition to the map of today, there would be a lot more states than there are now. The 13 states were created by the hands of kings. A democracy, Jefferson and others felt, could do better. Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island, all owed their borders to decisions made in London. Democracy could not change those states now, despite Hamilton's ribald suggestion that America could be made into equal states. That wasn't possible, but we could start anew with the new states. It was during the process of independence that suddenly an early decision would be made with future consequences. 
A state was a being, an entity, with representation in the decisions of independence. In the Continental Congress, Rhode Island had one vote, Virginia had one vote, yet Virginia was a giant compared to Rhode Island, both in size and population, and eventually Virginians would feel that they were underrepresented. Yet there was no other way. Delaware, South Carolina, Rhode Island and New Jersey, and the small states would have held up the independence, even if New York, Massachusetts, and Virginia agreed. Holes in the unity of the colonies would have allowed Britain to exploit them and undermine the new country before it started. It was an amazing thing that the 13 colonies together went along with independence, but it happened by treating states as beings, each with a vote regardless of their land mass or their population or even their time of being. New York, one of the oldest colonies, had an equal vote to Georgia, one of the newest. Yet in a land where all men were created equal, even if we accept uh, how off the statement was at times when one considers race, gender, and property limitations to that in 1776, but it was still an undemocratic system, even among the propertied men of Delaware who could vote. They had more say than the propertied men of Virginia. The concept of statehood was fluid. The Revolutionary War set no shape or size for states. States were the colonies. And an attempt by Vermont was telling when they attempted to make a new state out of New York. Immediately following the Revolution, they were denied. Even when the Constitution sought to make the Union more perfect, an impossible phrase, each state had one vote in that process. We could not get around the 13 colonies made by the king, even as we left the king's grace. A state was what it was, a former colony, who showed up to the room when a decision was made, either independence or on the country's constitution. They were the people in the room in 1776 and then 1787. Statehood is now then what it was unjustifiable, perhaps irrational, sometimes illogical political power. William Patterson, the husky little politician from New Jersey, challenged the attempt by James Madison to, quote, fix the Constitution by making the states equal by their population in terms of representation. Jersey was a being and not just a sum of its parts. Patterson rejected the population-based system of representation which would destroy, in many ways, the state lines. Delaware and New Jersey, despite smaller populations, were not the same as a county in Virginia. They were entities, factions, sources of power. In 1787, most importantly, sources of votes in the Constitutional Convention. Patterson was taking an undemocratic stand, a stand that now makes people in Brooklyn, perhaps, less powerful in their representation in federal government than those in Boise. Yet New Jerseyans loved Patterson, and in every Democratic vote, he won. And at that time, at least, Patterson's argument had merit. The other way of globbing together the whole country and removing state borders was way too radical, and small states would not sign up for it. As one delegate threatened, they would leave the convention and perhaps find a foreign power to take them by the hand pesky small states. Now we have a compromised federal government, two senators for every entity we choose to call a state, and a House of Representatives using Madison's system of popular representation. The Constitution was not interested in defining what a state should be. They made it an easy threshold. A simple vote of Congress could admit a state. It's harder to overturn a veto of a president than to add to the states of the United States. With new states, the Jeffersonian ideals were at least influential on Congress's thinking. It's partly the reason that as states gave up lands after the Revolutionary War to help build the nation, Kentucky and Tennessee were created to be roughly the same shape. Mississippi and Alabama were also close to each other's size. Even in the 1880s, as Congress divided up the Dakotas, they did so fairly equally. Where Congress has a choice, it seemed, 
they have chosen over the years to preserve the Jeffersonian idea of equality of size among the states. But in cases where it had no choice, Texas in 1844, the Congress took what it got. Texas was an independent republic and could not easily be broken up. But in the case of Colorado, which was then part of Jefferson territory, when they wanted statehood and sought a land that would now encompass several states, and when Utah, part of something called the Deserter Territory, self-titled by the residents, when they submitted requests for a huge state in the West, Congress knocked both of these requests down to size and changed their names to boot, which is why we have the roughly smaller states of Utah and California. Jefferson told Madison that a large state shouldn't be pursued because it would break up into factions. When he won the new Louisiana lands from France, after Louisiana Purchase, he was careful to keep the French-speaking people in one state, thus the borders we have of Louisiana, so that they would feel self-governed. When Jefferson described the size of state he was saying would be too large and would break up to factions to Madison, he could not know, then, that he was describing about the exact size of California. No state in 1850, nor even now save the Alaska was as large as that state. And so in 1850, as Congress debated the issue, Jeffersonian ideals of statehood were on the line. But so was slavery. Southerners, Southerners wanted to bring slaves to mining lands. A young congressman from Mississippi, Jefferson Davis, hoped that most of the slaves in his state could be sent to California mines in return for cash, and the South could be rid of the slavery problem, but retain the wealth. And along with a longtime defender of the South, John C. Calhoun of South Carolina, Davis urged Congress to approve California as a slave state. But when the men who had been on the Oregon and their cargo arrived from California, there was a problem. The new state constitution forbid slavery. California was, by a convention held in Sacramento, to be entered into the Union as a free state. The gold miners in California didn't want to compete with slave labor. Besides, as a Mexican province, slavery had been illegal in California for 20 years, and the majority of American settlers there had been from free states. Also, among the Californians urging statehood was a surprise. William Gwynn, a wealthy slaveholder, plantation older, owner from Mississippi, who knew many of the Southern congressmen and senators, who had very recently moved to California, and immediately started running for a Senate seat. Sensing a political opportunity, Gwynn, the slaveholder, supported the Free State Plank at the convention, and now was proposed as a senator to be, along with the explorer John Fremont. He would make the appeal to Southern senators and congressmen. There is no hope. He knew the mining lands well, the people that brought the population to the state of California. There is no hope for status of slavery. The miners were too much against it. But the U.S. needed a new state, the U.S. needed the gold, and William Gwynn needed a Senate seat. Between the opposition of leading Southerners such as Jefferson Davis and Calhoun, and the Northern abolitionist leaders, and the appearance of this ship with a state constitution and bricks of gold, there was a standstill. Henry Clay, the senator now from Kentucky, in what would be his final act on the political stage, the final curtain call of a 44-year career, Clay offered a compromise, approve California as a free state and like they want, then approve a new tough fugitive slave law that would require people in northern states to return fugitive slaves to the owners in the South. Admitting California made Southerners angry. Supporting the fugitive slave law made Northerners angry. Yet, Clay was willing to compromise. He saw it as the only way to preserve the Union. He managed to string Daniel Webster along, but among Southerners, opposition was solid. 
There are really many reasons to listen to our podcast, Big Picture Science. It's kind of a challenge to summarize them all, Molly. Okay, here's a reason to listen to our show, Big Picture Science, because you love to be surprised by science news. We love to be surprised by science news. So, for instance, I learned on our own show that I had been driving around with precious metals in my truck before it was stolen. That was brought up in our show about precious metals and also rare metals, like most of the things in your catalytic converter. I was surprised to learn that we may begin naming heat waves like we do hurricanes. You know, prepare yourself for heat wave Lucifer. I don't think I can prepare myself for that. Look, we like surprising our listeners. We like surprising ourselves by reporting new developments in science and while asking the big picture questions about why they matter and how they will affect our lives today and in the future. Well, we can't affect lives in the past, right? No, I I guess that's a point. (laughs) So the podcast is called Big Picture Science and You can hear it wherever you get your podcasts. We are the hosts. Seth is a scientist. I'm a science journalist. And we talk to people smarter than us. We hope you'll take a listen. Calhoun, in what also would be his last political act on the stage, up the ante. Vote for California, he said, and the South will leave the Union. It's that simple. Stalemate ensued. Nobody changed positions. The Californians stayed in Washington and tried to lobby hard. But California was now not a state nor territory, nor foreign country. It was in limbo. President Zachary Taylor might have been expected to exert some leadership, but not in this case. He refused to use his influence in the matter. His position was unique. He felt that it was wrong to admit California as either a free or a slave state. Just admit the state, he said, with no comment on its status. Taylor's odd position had logic, but was unpopular in both the North and the South. Taylor would have been a hindrance to the issue and could have vetoed any compromise legislation, perhaps. But with no warning, Taylor died while this issue was being decided. Some type of a gastrointestinal disease. Millard Fillmore, the vice president, became president. Fillmore sided with Clay and Webster, and he pushed additional senators and congressmen to support Clay's plan. The Congress passed it, and Fillmore, now president, signed the Compromise of 1850 into law. California was now a state. And was evidence that a state need not be a territory first on its way to statehood, though nearly every other state has seen some type of territory status until it was big enough to, quote, grow up into statehood. California was different. The gold mines had brought the population instantly. All a state needs, and this is a low constitutional threshold again, is a vote of Congress. And a vote of the state where the state came from if it was carved out of another state. Not the case in this matter. And it needs not to be vetoed by the president. Were such veto overridden. For the North and the South, California's admission would turn out to be a very good thing. For the South, short term at least, adding a free state to the Union would mean the addition of William Gwynn, a pro-Southern senator, who, having done his penance for supporting free state California, now voted with anything the state wanted. And, along with a new senator once Fremont stepped down that was supportive of the South, was a big supporter of President Buchanan. The votes of Gwynn's political machine would be crucial to passing the Kansas-Nebraska Act. But for the North, California's addition would prove important, as gold went a long way to finance the Union effort in the Civil War. Generally, the U.S. government has viewed statehood as a good thing. For a country concerned about security as we were in 1787, settlers were good. A buffer was great. Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York, Virginia, North Carolina, and Georgia all gave land in order to make new territories owned by the federal government for the purpose of being eventually turned into states. So the bar was set low for statehood. Political reasons for statehood were present. By creating Kentucky and Tennessee, Virginia and North Carolina gained four senators supportive of the cause of slavery. Mississippi and Alabama and Texas's creation would be fueled by similar motives. Vermont and Illinois 
were somewhat created to counter those new southern states. Trade-off was made when Missouri was added as a slave state and Maine as a free one. Despite getting two pro-South Senate votes as it would turn out, Southerners initially were enraged about the addition of California as a free state. Not only was the dream of unloading their slaves for California cash now lost, but a precedent was set in the most far-flung Western state that Western states would be free. Action was required. The governor of Mississippi and a few others attempted an invasion of Cuba to create another state where slaves would be permitted. This failed when the Taylor administration sent troops to arrest the Cuban attackers and destroy their vessels. There was to be no Bay of Pigs on Zachary Taylor's watch. Next, the pro-slavery minority in the sparsely populated ranching area of Southern California would attempt to form a second state of South California. Even then, the culture was different between the two areas. The northern end was a group of mining camps. The city of San Francisco, which was becoming a sprawling urban center, had most of the population. The south was home to a few big ranches. L.A. was a small community. San Diego was a clean but modest port. The treaty with Mexico specifically allowing for its addition. Southern sympathizers, including Senator Gwynn and his political machine, advocated the case of Mexican settlers who felt restricted by the government in Sacramento and wanted their own South California state. And so using the Mexican ranchers, they attempted to present the case as a case of indigenous rights. Logically, it's not a difficult case to make for Southern California because of its size. It's still coming up today as an issue in some cases. Should California split between North and South? There's water issues and, and other issues. Well, it's not something that Congress can do alone, because in the Constitution, the one limitation of the states is if they're carved out of a part of state, you need the state's consent. But Congress got that in 1859. A bill passed the California Assembly that California could be split in two. It was bad timing for the South California movement. The nation was on the brink of civil war, and Congress had little interest in creating a new state, especially a slave state. And Congress was run by the new Republican Party after the midterms of 1858. So California, like Texas, remains one of the biggest states in the Union in physical size. Alaska is the largest by size, a state far larger than Jefferson would have liked to allow. But like California, Alaska fell victim to politics on its quest for statehood that began in the 1940s. Like California, Alaska smartly sent pre-elected officials to Congress, and they helped to shore up support. Southerners resisted. Any Senate votes outside the South could be pro-civil rights votes. But as the 50s went on and the Cold War accelerated, the propaganda battle with the Soviet Union continued, and the U.S. having territories or could be considered colonies just didn't seem to match up the appearance of a free state that we were giving out to the world. The fact that Alaska and Hawaii, which was also fighting for statehood at this time, were on the frontier of America, Alaska bordering the Soviet Union, Hawaii in the midst of the Pacific, didn't hurt. And so in 1959, with a little help from Sam Rayburn and Lyndon Johnson, Alaska and Hawaii were added. Statehood offers several things. Rule over one's land, thousands of new state jobs, electoral votes, a judiciary system, and most importantly, two senators. That last fact, a result of the compromise at the Constitutional Convention to protect statehood as a concept, has spawned new states and defeated some plants. After the Civil War, there was a rush to bring in the seceded states back in under Republican governments. But after Reconstruction brought Redeemer governments, Democrat governments, to these states, Republicans went west to seek new senators. States of Washington and North and South Dakota were added to bolster Republicans during this time. Nevada was added in 1864 to help Lincoln gain a few electoral votes. 
but it also added to generally Republican senators during the 19th century. But is that all statehood is about? Two senators? Just the politics? There are a few clues on the map of the United States. It would be nice to see some kind of master plan looking at our United States map. But this is not the case. Borders have been set by kings, by prominent city locations, by discoveries of gold and silver, by treaties with foreign powers, by rivers and important lakes. Religion has also contributed to the map. New Hampshire split out of Massachusetts because Charles III wanted to keep Puritans in Massachusetts at bay. Delaware has the size and small shape that it does because Dutch farmers didn't want to be swallowed by Quaker Pennsylvania or Catholic Maryland. New York and New Jersey got its border from a disputed land grant after a period in which tax collectors from both states tried to collect from the poor residents. Michigan got its well-known Upper Peninsula after lands were taken from it to make Indiana and Ohio. Then, when it became a state, the Upper Peninsula was granted as a makeup. Memphis is part of Tennessee because Jackson purchased the land from the Choctaw Indians. There is, there seems, no one way to make a state. Is statehood an, a dying institution now? The 17th Amendment took the election of federal senators from the state legislatures and has eroded state legislatures in the federal system. It's a silent result of a law that seems so good, progressive and democratic, and it was. But now legislatures only involve themselves in federal law when a constitutional amendment comes up. We were state crazy in the 1700s and the 1800s, but it slowed in the 20th century. There was Alaska and Hawaii, but now for 50 years, there's been no state. Is statehood dying as a concept? Let's look at the few parts of the United States property where statehood does not exist and is discussed. We generally think of statehood as a good thing for Puerto Rico, an island that was won in the Spanish-American War in 1898. Statehood has been a recurring question. In 1917, in what was seen as an incentive to increase enlistments right in time for World War I, the Jones Act made Puerto Ricans U.S. citizens. 20,000 Puerto Ricans served. Between the choice of becoming an independent nation, remaining some kind of a territory, or becoming a state, tensions remained. So much so that nationalists, those who wanted independence for Puerto Rico, tried to assassinate President Truman. It remains today one of the boldest attempts to assassinate an American president. Truman was fairly well protected at the Blair House while the White House was being renovated but a Secret Service agent was killed during the attack. At that point, statehood was not an option. Southern senators were blocking any attempt to make the Northern Territory of Alaska state, fearing a loss of control in the Senate. No one was about to grant statehood for Puerto Rico, and it was not clear that Puerto Ricans wanted it. In the early 1950s, Puerto Rico held a referendum, allowing a convention which would choose either statehood or a commonwealth system, a kind of in-between status between statehood and independence. The plurality of votes was for the commonwealth. In 1952, Congress passed, and President Truman signed a bill making Puerto Rico a free associated state, or an Estado Libre Asociado. This is commonly referred to as a commonwealth. It is a unique arrangement for the United States. Puerto Rico is not a free state. It's not a country in that they are subject to U.S. jurisdiction and sovereignty. The President of the United States is the head of the Puerto Rican state. It has no embassies, no senators, only a non-voting House member. Most residents of the island, so long as they do not work for the U.S. government, pay no U.S. income taxes. 
But given the income on the island, many residents would not pay income taxes anyway. They do pay the taxes that those of all income levels would pay. Social Security, Medicare, the FICA taxes. In 1967, a referendum was held and 60% supported the Commonwealth status. And elections in 1993 and 1997 gave a plurality to the Commonwealth system. Although the governor right now, Luis Fortuno, is a statehood party candidate from the PDP party, there seems to be little interest in statehood for the island at this point. The island had probably its biggest impact on American politics when it was the site of one of the late Democratic primaries. Parties do allow uh, Puerto Rico to vote and send delegates to their conventions. Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama seriously contested the state, and Hillary Clinton won overwhelmingly. Of course, neither candidate took on the issue of statehood versus commonwealth status. This leads us to the question of statehood for the one area of mainland U.S. that has no representatives in the federal government. The District of Columbia's population has boomed in recent years. It is becoming a popular place to live as well as work. Yet its residents have no voice over the most important aspect of federal government, Congress. Unlike the citizens of Puerto Rico, they do pay U.S. income tax, but don't vote for representatives to determine how that's spent. They have a non-voting House member, currently Eleanor Holmes Norton. She can vote on committees, but not on regular votes of the House of Representatives. Every license plate in the district reads, no taxation without representation. The 23rd Amendment gave D.C. residents three electoral votes, though those votes have yet to be decisive in a presidential election. Had a couple close ones recently, though, and there's always the possibility that they may come in to be decisive. But since the passage of the 23rd, they haven't been decisive. When its population was declining, there was less talk about D.C. statehood. But now that it has the population of at least one other state, talk is more serious. It is a crime against democracy that residents of D.C. cannot determine how their tax dollars are spent. They cannot elect representatives to declare whether we should go to war with another nation or, as is so often the case in modern times, whether we support a president's decision to use military force. They don't have representatives to do that. We have no direct evidence that George Washington or Thomas Jefferson wanted the residents of the federal city called for in the Constitution to vote, but there's certainly no evidence that they wanted them to be disenfranchised. The capital was in Philadelphia in the early years, and residents of that city voted, and residents of Philadelphia had representatives according to their population. The capital was in New York for a few years, and residents in that city voted, and the city's population had representatives according to its population. There was no distinction made during the time that those cities were federal cities that a certain area wouldn't have representation. It would make no sense for the Constitution to create a city in which people would not have rights. The more logical explanation is they didn't think of it because as of the time of the Constitutional Convention, the federal city didn't exist. It was just a concept put in the document that there should be a federal city. It would be about 13 years after the Constitution that Washington, D.C. would be, in effect, open for business. And even then, it was small. It was so small, and thus, while not correct, the offense to democracy of not having representatives for those living there was small. Now, as the city has over a half a million, the offense to democracy is that much larger. So it's clear that D.C. should have some type of federal representation. But is statehood the answer? Statehood would bring a House member easily and two senators. Based on voting trends, it would probably bring two Democratic senators in and very likely two very liberal senators in. And so once again, like throughout history, there is concern about the Senate when it comes to a new state. The same concern that was present when California, Texas, Missouri, Maine, the Dakotas, and so many other states were brought in. 
there's a concern about state government, given the checkered history of mayors running D.C. I don't dismiss those. D.C. government has been getting better in recent years, and I don't dismiss completely the political realities. But I do dismiss any notion that the founders wouldn't have wanted D.C. to have representation in Congress. It would be against everything in the founding documents to assume that. It is true that elections are already conducted by states, and D.C. is not a state. But there's no way they would have considered that the federal city would grow to 591,833 people, one-twentieth of the population of America's biggest city, New York. So if compared to the biggest city of that time, Philadelphia, at about 40,000 people, I can't imagine that a community of 2,000 Americans would have been neglected. That would have been a large community then. The city wasn't that large. It was so small. It had such little population. Most of the people living there were representatives or people who were voting somewhere else. It was an oversight, not a mandate for the future. And nearly 600,000 people, the District of Columbia has more population than Wyoming. It has more population than the Constitutional Republic monarchy of uh, Luxembourg, with 493,500 people. Luxembourg, of course, has 999 square miles, but this is more than D.C. 63 miles. Herein lies the problem for D.C. Statehood, that's harder to overcome. Delaware has 873,000 people, but there are over 2,490 square miles. D.C., just 63. Now, physical distance doesn't necessarily matter. If physical distance mattered, there would be specific language in the Constitution determining what the size of a state should be. It's not in there. We have Jefferson weighing in. We have the precedent of every other state, which has been larger since the original 13. But there's no language in the Constitution for that. Strictly constitutional speaking, it doesn't matter. Congress can vote to make a three-square-mile area a state if the state it is in consents, or if it's built out of a new territory. If we learned anything today, it's that there is no absolute definition of what statehood is or what a state is. The idea of a city-state is not totally without precedent. Virginia, for instance, has counties and then cities. So Richmond and Alexandria are cities. They're not just simply a city within a county. They have their own jurisdiction within the state. New York City uh, offers a similar example. New York puts... Uh, New York consists of several counties. Each borough of the city of New York is a county. So while New York City doesn't represent itself to the state as a separate entity from the rest of the state, it consists of counties that exactly duplicate its borough borders, growth or decline. We assume that the District of Columbia is at 591,000 and growing. And if it grows, that's great. It could even get two House members then and go further to justify its statehood status as it eclipses other states in population that are even bigger. But what if it declines? Once you create a state, that's it. I mean, it could be carved in half with its consent. It could give up land to Virginia or Maryland. But there seems to be no way in the Constitution to erase a state. It is an entity of the United States. So once we make it a state, it's permanent. So even if the population shrinks to 250,000, they will still get two senators, as does California. This could be said, of course, of any state. There will be people moving in and people moving out all the time. But when a state consists of just one city, and cities are at different times fashionable and at different times not, there might be a greater danger of that population loss than in a larger land mass area with lots of different places subject to different population trends. And even a third problem may be copycats. If you allow a city-state, the District of Columbia, 
Does New York now ask to be a state? Does Chicago? Does Los Angeles? Based on what we've seen, the confused history of states, their origins, their borders, their reasons for being, I see no reason why a state of the District of Columbia is not possible. Of course, the permanence is a strong issue, governance is an issue, and how the politics will work out. It might be very tempting right now for Democrats to add two likely Democratic senators to the permanent mix, just as in the 19th century, Republicans added what they thought at least were two, four, eight permanent Western senators, likely to be Republicans, by adding new states. There may or may not be support for such an, e an effort. It may require constitutional amendment. Ray may require something that really hasn't happened before, and that's have the full weight of the White House, of a president, behind the D.C. statehood effort for it to happen. But the mechanism's not hard. It's a simple vote of Congress signed by the president. To me, though, the issue is more of representation and not statehood. D.C. residents pay income taxes, and no one in the House represents them, the key place where bills of money are originated. It should be a shame to most Americans, and if they knew it, I believe fair-minded Americans would agree. Most polls do show support for representation by D.C. Statehood's not the only way. There's a couple of ways to do it. And one is to give D.C. a voting House member. That may sound not sound like much. One vote out of what would then be 430 six members of Congress. Or perhaps if we held a number at 435 and just uh, take took it out of some area that's losing population, it would just be the addition of one out of 435. That may not seem like much. But over time, it could mean a lot. A single House member right now is, is very little. As they grow, as they join committees, if they keep getting reelected, they become more powerful. House has a lot of, there's a lot of benefits to seniority in the House. And that person could become very influential, far beyond just the one out of 435 or 36. Another option is to allow the population of D.C. to vote in either Maryland or Virginia in the Senate and House races. Population would have an obvious impact on these states, and they would have federal representation, senators and Congress people eager to do work for them. Now, what about other 51st states or 52nd, 53rd? Why do we stop nearly 50 years ago? I mean, it might seem that if we haven't done something for 50 years, it's done. But one of our advantages as watchers of history is that we have a good perspective. We know, for instance, that it took 50 years for the first time that Congress overrid a president's veto. And it has been six, and there have been in the past 60 year gaps between constitutional amendments. No part of the Constitution dies by not using it necessarily. A president was impeached once, and then 130 years later, a second president was impeached. We should not dare to think that statehood is shut down. It's just inaction at the moment, mostly because of political stalemate, that every time you add a state, you have to add two senators, and one party or the other thinks it won't be good for them. Controversial as it is, if we stay in Iraq, or if we stay in Afghanistan, for 20 more years, it doesn't seem likely at this point, but it's possible, would there ever be a call for a state? It might sound like building an empire, but is it better than sort of occupying with troops? At what point do you have to consider statehood in these places? Five years, 10 years, 15 years? Do you consider statehood for a part of the area that uh, perhaps with a referendum, wants to be part of the United States. The mechanism is there. It might have sound crazy to uh, Thomas Jefferson that we would make a state out of the nation of Hawaii. More likely, any recent attention will focus on District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands. But second to that, 
Splitting states may be the more likely scenario. There's the continuous issue of North and South California. Statehood in America is in the eye of beholder. Beholder being the representatives of the American people at the current time, and it's always been. The deal made to force a group to be part of the new nation, that each state get two of the most powerful people in Washington, has fueled some new states and has been a burden to new states at other times. I want to thank you for listening. The website is myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. Just run a search for us on Facebook. We're also there. I want to remind you about the archive for $9.99. The archive's available. It has most of the shows we recorded since 2006. So if you like this podcast, if you're a fairly recent listener, you're going to hear a lot of shows that you haven't heard yet. I've covered a lot of topics, a lot of issues. Uh, they signed uh, the new pod book about the signers of the Declaration of Independence. If you want to learn more about those folks, some very interesting people that we don't know enough about, that's available.